heard the word before, the term, but maybe we don't exactly understand what a crucible is. Can you help us understand that? Well, um, I don't know whether you were any good at science at school. Um, that wasn't really my strong point, but I remember in the chemistry lab, there was this tripod, a black metal tripod, uh, and on the top of this tripod, there was a little shallow dish, and underneath it was a Bunsen burner with a, 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 a hot flame. And then what we would do is put different materials into this crucible. That was what the name of the dish was, a crucible, because then we would see what would happen to the elements inside the crucible once it was heated up with this extreme heat. And so that was, I guess, my first introduction to a crucible. And this is something that we, um, we begin to see in the Bible that God uses crucibles. But maybe let me start with a, a dictionary definition. Um, the Merriam-Webster's uh, Collegiate Dictionary um, defines a crucible in three different ways. Um, a, a vessel of a very refractory material used for melting, a, a substance that requires a high degree of heat. Uh, number two, a severe test. Uh, or number three, a place or situation in which concentrated forces interact to cause or influence change or development. And I think particularly those last two ideas, a severe test, a place which concentrates forces together. So there is going to be uh, something happening, um, a, a mixing together of different forces to lead to change, like in my, in my chemistry lab at school. And so this idea is what we see God talking about and God using for his own people, um, which for many people can seem like a really strange idea. And I know sometimes when I've talked about this dynamic in the Bible, many people have, have sort of shrunk back and it's like, no, surely God doesn't work like this. Um, but again, as we will unpack through the quarter, uh, yes, yes, he does. Um, there are other reasons for crucibles. But in this, in this uh, lesson this week, we're looking at four major reasons why suffering comes um, and the, the change that can result of that. And for a lot of people, they have this, this idea, we'll call it a misconception because I think that's, that's accurate that when a person becomes a Christian, all of a sudden life just becomes better and it's a, a bed of roses and it's just wonderful and smooth. And that's, that's really not the case. In fact, Peter in our memory text this week talks about people being surprised when challenges come. Where does that surprise come from? Should we be surprised? Yes, well, let, let me read that verse because I think it's a, a very important verse. And I think perhaps I was surprised when I first read that verse that it was there. Um, but this is, this is what Peter says. This is 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13. He says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you but rejoice to the extent that you partake in Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Now this word surprised means to be foreign or alien. And as you said, sometimes we think when this bad stuff happens, it's like, God, I'm, I'm trying to do what you want me to do. I know you're loving. And then this stuff happens. And this should not be part of my journey if you're loving and I'm doing my best. And I've had many people, and maybe you have too, where they have been utterly stunned to discover that God actually uses crucibles for different reasons. As we said, some of the reasons or the causes of crucible come from Satan. Some come from God, um, but what Peter is saying here, when these difficulties come, don't be surprised. 
And uh, similar reminds me of what Jesus says in Matthew 24 when he talks about wars and rumors of wars. Um, he says, these things will happen, but don't be alarmed. It's sort of a parallel idea. Yes, we live in this world and for many different reasons, pain and suffering will come into our lives, but don't be alarmed, don't be worried. Our task is really, when it comes, uh, what do we do with it? And as I said, we're going to be trying to unpack these kind of four different reasons for suffering to come into our lives um, throughout the, uh, the days ahead. Before we dive into these four reasons, which we're going to get to in just a moment, there's a, a poem that has been attributed to John Milton. It may or may not have been actually authored by him, but it, it makes an interesting point. Talk with us about that. Yes, well, as, as you said, um, we're not sure exactly who authored this. I, I did my very best to find it. Um, if it was John Milton, uh, John Milton, the author of Paradise Lost, he was blind. Um, wrote a, an, an astonishing poem. Um, but in these two verses, the author is expressing their surprise and, and shock at the suffering they go, they're going through. And um, maybe you can resonate with some of the sentiment that we've got in this poem. So let me read it to you. Is it true, O Christ in heaven, that the highest suffer most, that the strongest wander furthest and more helplessly are lost, that the mark of rank in nature is the capacity of pain and the anguish of the singer makes the sweetness of the strain? Is it true, O Christ in heaven, that whichever way we go, walls of darkness must surround us, things that we would but cannot know, that the infinite must bound us like a temple veil untent, whilst the finite ever wearies, so that none's therein content. And you know, I just, when, when I first read it, you, you just feel for the guy This is searching for answers. You know, is this really true? Um, and, and as we've got this surprise here, um, our task is now, and if you're watching and you're surprised uh, at what is going on in your own life at the moment or has been going on. Hopefully what we're going to look at now is some ways to help us understand why these things do come and realize that we don't need to be alarmed. So we want to unpack why suffering comes. And, and I don't think, uh, as you mentioned, we're going to be able to answer every question in every circumstance. But there are at least four main reasons why suffering takes place that you, you draw our attention to. What were those four main reasons or four common reasons? Yeah, let me, let me summarize these um, as, as we start off. Um, first of all, we, we suffer because Satan is at work in the world. He's, bad things are happening. Satan is doing things. I see it and it hurts my heart. Um, it's not my fault. Um, but what I see and I hear through my TV or, or whatever, um, that causes pain in my life. The second um, reason for suffering is that I sin. And the consequences of sin is painful. Um, if I lie or I steal or I have an affair, um, the consequences of my actions will bring pain to me. It'll bring pain, pain to other people as well. Um, then there is a, a third reason. So maybe I've gone down a particular road and I've gone down a long way, but God knows that I can be redeemed. And this is where we get the idea of the refiner's fire comes in. And we see it in, in, the, in the history of Israel over and over and over again. So God allows them to go down a particular road to bring them to a point of crisis where they are really in pain as a whole people. Um, but that's a redemptive purpose, a refining purpose, because he wants his people to realize that he's there and he's there and he can help them. And so because of my sin, God may allow circumstances to go to a particular degree or level in order that I may 
I guess in one sense, paint myself into, co into a corner and realize, okay, no, I've made a mistake. God is there. He loves me and I'm going to start to trust him properly now. And then the fourth reason, which is a little bit similar to the third, but I put it in a, in a different category, is this idea of pruning. Um, so maybe there's not something very strong and powerful that is, uh, or a, a big sin that is um, something that God needs to remedy. But I, by nature, um, mess up regularly. I have weaknesses. Or maybe God sees something particularly that he, he sees that if you could be, go through a particular process now, you could be even more fruitful um, than you are being now. And so as a, as a gardener pr prunes a plant, so he prunes our lives for greater fruitfulness. And we'll, we'll get to that when we look in, in John 15 and the, the parable of the vine. So four main reasons why we go through, uh, through challenges, why we hurt. First, Satan's at work in the world. Second, we're suffering the consequences of our own sins. Third, God is working to purify us from sins. And fourth, God is working to mature us. You may know somebody who's going through pain, somebody who's going through hurt. Maybe that person is wearing your shoes right now. Maybe there's someone who's close to you. I want to encourage you to encourage them to watch these programs. This is week number two. Lesson number two, we have 13 lessons that we're going to be digging into this vital subject for Christians to understand. If you have the adult Bible, uh, Sabbath School Bible Study Guide already, and you're studying that, if you're watching these programs, you're getting more out of it by doing that. I also want to encourage you, make sure that you pick up the companion volume to this quarter's Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, and that is the book, The Refiner's Fire, by our guest, Gavin Anthony, also the author of the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. You can pick that up at itiswritten.shop. Again, itiswritten.shop. You'll find it there, and it will add even more to your study of this vital subject. We're brought to you by It Is Written. We are taking a look at the crucibles that come, the crucibles that we go through, and four main reasons why we hurt. So we're going to unpack each of those a little bit now. Uh, Gavin, let's talk about the first one. You mentioned that Satan is at work in the world. And so some of the pain, much of the pain, at least some of the pain that we go through, that we experience, the, the sadness, the hurt that we go through, is because we live in a fallen world. Help us to understand that a little bit better. Yes, well, maybe let's start with, with the Bible uh, and see what the Bible says uh, about this. And there are, there are, well, there's a number of texts, but let me mention a couple. The first is Revelation 12.12. 12. He says, therefore rejoice, you heavens and you who dwell in them, but woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. And we often talk about this great controversy between God and Satan. And here the author of Revelation is reminding us very bluntly, the devil has come down from heaven. He is here on the earth and he is angry. He knows his time is short. Well, what is he going to do in the short time he has left before Jesus returns and clears up this pain and suffering and mess? Well, he is going to do whatever he can to take as many people with him. He's going to try and cause as much misery and suffering to bring that into our lives. So, and I think one of the, the reasons for that is because if we suffer and we are hurting inside, we are perhaps more likely to conclude that, okay, again, I thought there was a God, um, but I'm suffering. He doesn't seem to be listening to me. Um, I, I'm fed up with this. I, I'm gone. I'm out of the church. I'm going to turn my back upon God. And so causing pain and suffering is one of the ways that Satan uses to disconnect us from God. And that can be, that can happen to any of us at, at any time. So Satan is angry and he is therefore causing pain. Now we come to, to Peter, 1 Peter 5, 8, um, where 
Peter says this, he says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Um, and you know, this, this is very graphic. Satan is walking around like a lion, trying to devour people. Well, he's not physically eating us, but he wants to take away our security in Christ. He's wanting us to uh, turn our backs on Christ and go in a different direction and lose our eternal salvation and the possibility of relationship with Jesus. Uh, and he is intent on this. And now, when Peter writes this originally, he's, he's talking to Christians who are suffering, the enduring uh, persecution. But I think in many ways, this is a general principle. Um, no matter what we are going through, Satan is at work. He wants to destroy as many people as possible. And, you know, just take, for example, um, I, I'm sure you have been heartbroken to see what has been going on in Ukraine. Um, the devastation, the destruction, the pain and the suffering. Uh, Satan is at work. And, you know, one of my prayers through this war, as we've had it so far, is that, that God will strengthen the Christians in Ukraine to be strong and not give up, that they will be agents of light. Um, we have this kind of picture that Paul has, uh, I think it's in Philippians, about stars sparkling in the darkness. Um, and, and so there's this darkness. Satan is, is at work. He's doing his thing. And so to pray that the Christians will still in this hold on to their hope, hold on to Christ, hold on to your confidence, because that light in the middle of the darkness can bring people back to God. And I often think about it, you know, we look at our night sky and it, it's, it's completely black, except for these tiny pinpoints of light. So no matter the, the, the tragedy that is there, as we as Christians hold on to Jesus, and he, he puts his hope into us, we can pass that on to others. Uh, so, yeah, Satan is at work. It's not nice. It's not necessarily my fault, but it caused me a lot of pain. And, and as we go on in here, um, Peter says um, to be alert. In other words, realize who is to blame. Be sober minded, self control. Don't allow the pain and the pressure of what Satan is doing around in the world to reshape your feelings to take you away from God. Resist him. Uh, don't be overwhelmed. Uh, realize that Satan has no power. Uh, we can call upon the whole resources of heaven. You are not alone wherever you are. And as you resist him, Christ will be at your side. The shepherd, as we talked about uh, last week, he is with you and you don't need to worry, even though the pain and suffering in the world, perhaps we, as we see around us, is, is increasing at a dramatic rate. So Satan is certainly at work. Somebody once said that he is, he is a true workaholic. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't rest. He's always at work. He causes some of the pain and suffering that we have. But as Tuesday's lesson makes, uh, makes plain, we can't attribute everything to him. Sometimes there are choices that we make uh, also that, uh, that bring that suffering. Absolutely. Um, I mess up. And the consequences of my messing up is, is pain and suffering sometimes. Now, I'm using the words mess up a little bit flippantly. Um, Paul, perhaps in Romans 6.23, is a little bit more blunt and pointed. You know, he talks about the wages of sin is death. Um, and there, there is the, an ultimate death, but there's also that process of dying spiritually, which, which is very painful. And again, if, if I sin, um, if I have an affair with somebody, I am going to suffer as a consequence of that. Uh, my family, my kids, my wife, all the, the members of the other party's family, there's so much pain and suffering that comes in because of things I chose to do. Sometimes um, I deliberately choose to dump, do something that is wrong. I might not deliberately try and do something, but it might still be wrong. 
um, I can be driving down the road and go over the spe speed limit. Um, I didn't realize, uh, but I still get a ticket and I have to pay for it and my wallet doesn't thank me. Um, that causes me a little bit of pain and obviously we're looking at very different types of, of pain here. But the basic idea is that my, cons my choices can lead to pain and suffering and God doesn't necessarily leap in to rescue me from experiencing that pain. You make mention of uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 18, which speaks of the wrath of God being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. What happens when, when we sin, when we move away from God, we live apart from His will? What are some of the steps that are taken to, to go on that journey, that unfortunate journey? Yeah, this is a very interesting passage, and I remember coming across it years ago, and it was sort of, sort of my eyes widened as, as I looked at the dynamics here. Uh, first of all, it talks about the wrath of God, and that sounds very, um, it's very an emotive phrase, it sounds very dramatic, we're not really sure what this wrath is, but when you actually read through this passage, in this context, the wrath of God is God allowing us, allowing me, to do what I choose to do. He allows me to reap the consequences of my sin. And we don't have a long time to really look at this, but there are sort of four steps. Um, the first step is where I refuse to honor him. Um, and the consequence of that is, and this is verse 21, their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were hardened. That's the first consequence as I begin to drift away from God. Um, the second one is I begin to create idols. Um, and God says here, he says, and this is in verse 24, um, God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. Um, then the third uh, step is that um, I begin to worship the idols that I create. And in verse 26 and 27, um, Paul gives a list of, of sexual sins. And I, I think it, it's, it's fascinating that what Paul clearly is pointing at here is that as I drift away from this vertical relationship with God, um, my horizontal relationships with people begin to fall apart. And that is a great tragedy. So in order to restore human relationships, I need to restore this, this vertical relationship. And then finally, um, the, is where the knowledge of God is completely rejected. And it says God gave them over to a depraved mind. And there are consequences to what happened when we block our mind and we, we stop um, God being, or our, our minds are no longer sensitivity to the voice of God. And that leaves us in a, in, a, in a terrible, terrible situation, both as individuals and as a culture. But, but this is the reality that we live in today, and we've probably all seen people who are taking those unfortunate steps. Our time is slipping away from us, but I do want to try to cover as much as we can here on Wednesday and Thursday. Wednesday talks about the crucibles of purification. God wants to purify us through these challenges, these trials that we go through. How does he do that? The same knife that cuts off branches is also used to prune. And, and um, it, it says in, in there that in, in, in uh, John 15, one and two, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. And so Jesus sees that by allowing me into certain situations, I may become more like him. And, one of my favorite quotes in this is Bruce Wilkinson. He says, are you praying for God's uh, superabundant blessings and pleading that he will make you more like his son? If so, you are asking for the shears. And so sometimes God will allow us in situations so that we will become more fruitful. Our dependence, our faith, our trust in God will be deeper so that the Holy Spirit will be enabled to fill us in, in, a, in a more profound way that through us, his character will be revealed. So God permits us to go through these trials, through these challenges, through this pain as a, as a 
preparatory process, a purification process, a pruning process. And he'll help us through if we will allow him to. Gavin, I wonder if you would have a prayer for our viewers that God would encourage them in their times of trial. Uh, Father, we can often be fearful of the thought of heartache being at the, at the heart of your holy purposes. It often seems like a contradiction to everything we think we know about you, but, but open our eyes, our spiritual eyes, our discernment to understand your purposes and your methods and grant us the courage to follow you no matter what the cost is. For the sake and for the glory of Christ, I pray. Amen. Gavin, thank you for joining us and thank you for joining us this week as well. We will be back again next week as we continue this fascinating study into the purpose of sorrow and why God allows us to go through the crucible so that he can prepare us for the day when Jesus comes. God bless you. We'll see you next time.